Hello class, in this video, we're going to cover section 4.3, problem solving. In this assignment, there are 16 questions. So number one says, determine if the following statement is true or false. When making a choice between various sizes of product, the best value is the size with the lowest price. This statement is actually false because the best value should be the product with the lowest unit price assuming that the units are kept uniform. What that means is just because it costs me $5 for one item, but yet it costs me $10, or er, I'm sorry, it costs me $6 for two of the same item. This is not the best value. I'm paying $5 for every single uh, item in this, um, category. Whereas here, if it cost me $6 for two, then I'm only paying three bucks per item. So the best value would be this option, not that option, because you want to know what the price per unit is. How much does it cost just for one? Okay. Let me erase that. That was not part of the problem. I just was giving an example. Okay. Now, number two says, if the statement saves I'm sorry, if the student, <laughs> if the student saves $60 per week, how long will it take to save enough money to buy a computer? What necessary piece of information is missing that prevents solving the problem? We need to know the computer price, right? I cannot tell you how many weeks I'm gonna need to save if I don't know how much I'm gonna need to get this computer, okay? So the missing information here is the computer price. Um, number three, if it takes you five minutes to read a page in a book, how many words can you read in one minute? What necessary piece of information is missing that prevents solving the problem? It says I can read, it takes me five minutes to read a page. If it wants to know how many words that I can read, then I need to know uh, how many words are on a page. And so that's what I have here. The number of words on one page is necessary. Um, also says here that a salesperson receives a weekly salary of $450. In addition, $10 is paid for every sold, every item sold in excess of 200 items. How much extra is received from the sale of 210 items? Which piece of information is not necessary to solve the problem? I really don't need to know what the person's making each week in order for me to solve the problem. How much extra is needed? You just take, find out what the excess is because I get $10 for every item in excess of 200. So the number of items that are sold minus the 200 gives me 10 items in excess times the $10 for each one of those items gives me $100. So I would make $100 extra. Never did I need to use that 450 to make this calculation. And so that was the piece of information that was just essentially extra information that was unnecessary. As the problems get more complex throughout the semester, it will be important to be able to identify when and where there are extra bits of information that you don't need for a specific question. Um, now, number five says, use Polya's four-step method to solve the following problem. Um, and so I kind of wrote down what the steps are. I do not do that for every single problem, mostly because a lot of them are intuitive or common sense I, is another word that people use. Um, although sometimes common sense is not common. So that's a really debatable phrase. But anyway, the point is, is I'm going to write these steps explicitly once. And then after that, we're just going to do them. Okay. So step one in Polya's, Polya's uh, four-step method is to one, make sure you understand the problem. What are you reading? What does it mean? You have to understand that first before you have any luck of actually solving the problem. If you're reading that problem and your brain just cannot wrap itself around what is happening, then you're not going to be able to solve the problem. You have to be able to read it 
and understand what you're looking at and go from there. Okay, you have to not only just understand the information that you're given, but also understand the question that's being asked of you. Okay, um, you have to understand both of those pieces before you can keep going. Once you do have an understanding of the problem and the question or the information and the question, hence the problem, um, you will devise a plan because since you have a comprehension of what's going on and what is needed, that should be enough for you to create a plan on how to solve the problem, okay? Number three is just to carry out that plan. So if you had an idea, go ahead and go with it and do it, okay? And then the last step is to look back and check. So make sure that your answers make sense. Make sure that um, you don't have any errors, you know, things of that nature, okay? And so those are the four basic steps of uh, the polio's, me polio's method. Um, so for the first one, understand the problem. The problem is saying, which is a better value? And it's giving you one 15.3 ounce box of cereal for $4.62 or a 24 ounce box of cereal for $5.03. Um, I called the top one A, the 15.3 or 15 .3 ounce box A, and I called the 24 ounce box B, okay? Just so that I didn't have to write out everything each time, even though I ended up doing it anyway. Um, so the unit, my my divide my plan was if I'm trying to find quote unquote better value, it already talked about that in question one and that the better value is the unit price. And how do you find unit price? Unit price is found by taking the total price over the number of units, whatever it is. Okay. So in this case, they're both in ounces. And so that's why I have the word ounces down here. If they were both in pounds, this would be pounds. If they were both in um, grams, this would be grams. Whatever the case may be, they do have to be in the same unit. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take the unit price for the 15.3 ounce box, which means its price over the number of ounces in that box. And so I got this decimal, which rounded to, if I go to the nearest penny, rounds to just 30 cents per ounce. Now we find the unit price for the 24 ounce box, which is 5.03 over 24. I typed that in the decimal, this divided by 24, and it gave me this decimal and it's money. So I'm gonna round that, I get 21 cents per ounce, okay? So the 24 ounce box gives the best value. This one costs 30 cents per ounce. This one costs 21 cents per ounce. So this is the cheaper one or the, be the best value. And then it just says, look back and check. Um, really, as long as you didn't make any errors in your computations, you should be good with this particular problem. This is probably one of the most, and it's so early. Well, I guess technically we would have been in a month into the course if we were in a regular 16 week course. But this is probably the most beneficial bit of information you're gonna learn throughout this whole class. <laughs> And I know that's funny because I just have a dark sense of humor and we still have a whole bunch more different math concepts to learn. And it's just silly that they already taught you like the big, the big whammy. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've saved myself money in the grocery store just by calculating this unit price. And guess what? A lot of times the unit price that's on the tag, the price tag at HEB or wherever it is you go shopping is not correct. So what you need to do is you need to take that dollar amount that they're telling you on the price tag, check the box or container for that measurement, how many, whether it's ounces, grams, whatever it is. Um, and you make that, do this calculation yourself, okay? I'll tell you the most, I know and I'm getting a little bit off subject, I'm wasting your time, but I'm just letting you know that it's gonna come in handy. I just bought, um, what was it? Colombian coffee, the HEB brand of Colombian coffee. And they had the big box and then they had the little box. And I'm looking at them and I'm like, those numbers just don't seem right. So what I did was I calculated the unit price on both the small box and the big box. And generally when you buy in bulk, the uh, unit price is a lot lower. But 
the smaller boxes happened to be on sale. And so once they were on sale, that brought their unit price way below the unit price of the giant box. So I thought to myself, well, why would I spend that money on the giant box when I can just buy four of these smaller boxes? I get the same number of little pods because I do use the K cup pods. So I get way more of those little pods than buying the, the, the large box, okay? But again, I wouldn't have been able to save that dollar or two had I not known that, okay? Um, so it's super handy. I mean, I literally just used it. My last grocery trip was like two days ago. <laughs> so this one definitely, definitely is used a lot um, in real life, okay? Because I always get the million dollar question. Why do I need to learn all this? What does it have to do with my real life? This one, it this one is important, okay? Um, some of this other stuff is not super, super, like you're gonna use it every single day, um, but we still have to get through it. We have to check that box that says we are mathematically set, our brains work in a mathematical function and we're ready for the next thing. Okay, so for part B, it says, the supermarket displays the unit price for the 15.3 ounce box in terms of cost per ounce, but displays the unit price for the 24 ounce box in terms of cost per pound. Here's another example of when the grocery store will try to confuse you. It says, what are the unit prices to the nearest cent given with the supermarket by the supermarket? So for the unit price for the 15.3 ounce box, um, if it's in uh, cost per ounce, you've already figured that out, cost per ounce. It's just 30 cents per ounce. But to find the unit price for the 24 ounce box, we need to calculate the cost per pound. So what I did was I took this same formula, $5.03 divided by 24 ounces but I've got to convert these ounces into pounds. And it just so happens that there's 16 ounces per one pound. So I'm gonna to multiply top times top and I get this value, bottom times bottom and I get this value, and then 80.48 divided by 24, gave me this value and I do have to round because it's money. So I rounded that and it just became $3.35 per pound. So if you're looking at those two numbers on the little price tag, it might look like this one is way cheaper than that one, but you already know that it's not. The 24 ounce bottle is the cheaper one. So pay attention to your units as well. It is super important. Um, now here, um, it says based on our work in parts A and B, does the better value always have the lower displayed unit, unit price? And it's no, the 335 per pound is not the lowest units that can or should be displayed. The box is in ounces, so why on earth are they putting price per pound? That's because somebody didn't take this class when they was labeling those things, right? Um, so moving on to number six. Uh, a television sells for $800. Instead of paying the total amount at the time of purchase, the same television can be bought at paying $150 down and $50 a month for 14 months. How much is saved by paying the total amount at the time of purchase? So if I take my $50 per month and I multiply it by the 14 months I have to pay this 50 bucks, that's $700. Then I also put a down payment on it. So that's also money I had to pay. So the 700 from my monthly payments plus the 150 from my down, down payment, um, that is $850 total that I would have paid on the payment plan. But if I would have paid it uh, up front, just the 800, then I would have saved 50 bucks. Now, number seven, says each day a small business owner sells 200 pizza slices at $3 per slice and 85 sandwiches at $2 each. Business expenses come to $100 per day. What is the owner's profit for a 10-day period? So in order for me to figure out profit, I have to take the revenue, which is the money I make, minus the cost, okay? 
Now the cost is pretty easy. So I did that one first. It says that the business expenses, which is the cost, come to $100 per day. And if we're talking about a 10 day period, then that's $100 per day times 10 days. Those will cancel and I get $1,000. So it'll cost me $1,000 in this 10 day period. Now the revenue is the amount of money that I make, okay? So we for 200 pizza slices, it's gonna cost me $3 per slice. And so then that gives me $600 per day because I'm selling these 200 slices each day, okay? Um, then what I'm doing is I'm saying the same thing for the sandwiches. So 85 sandwiches times $2 per 80 or $2 per sandwich gives me $170 per day. Now, if I'm talking about per day together with the uh, slices of pizza and the sandwiches, I'm making $770 per day. But $770 per day times the 10 day period is how I'm getting $7,700. So this is the total revenue. This is all the money I'm making for the whole 10 day period. So there's my revenue minus my cost. And this is my profit. Now for number eight, it says um, a car rents for $200 per week plus 50 cents per mile. Find the rental cost for a two week trip of 500 miles for a group of three people. Well, I don't really care how many people are in the car, right? As long as they fit legally in the car, it doesn't really matter how many people are in the car. So this is one of those cases where they're giving me an extra bit of information. People are like, oh, a number of three, but that number three is not, not, uh, not necessary here. Now the other number two is, okay, and so are the 500, 250 cents. Um, so if we're talking about $200 uh, dollars per week and it's a two week trip, then that means I would have to take $200 per week and multiply it by two weeks, which means $400 for that type of cost. Then I'm charged 50 cents per mile and I went 500 miles. So 500 miles times the 50 cents per mile 50 times 0 0.50 is 250. So that's how much I'm paying for the miles. So this is how much I'm paying for the miles. This is how much I'm paying per week to rent the car. So together I am paying $650. Now, number nine says a store owner orders 25 calculators that cost $50 each. The store owner can sell each calculator for $58. The store owner sold 22 calculators to customers. He had to return three calculators that were never sold and pay a $5 charge for each returned calculator, although the initial cost is refunded. What is the store owner's profit? Now I did do it one way, but then I realized I probably could have done it a faster way. And so that's why you see this or and this mumbo jumbo over here on the side. So I'm gonna go over what I did initially and then I'll explain why I could have done it differently, okay? So first thing I did was I figured out how much it was gonna cost me to get these things, right? Because again, profit is revenue minus cost. So how much did it cost me to get this stuff? So 25 calculators times $50 per calc means it cost the store owner $1,250 originally, okay? Um, then we had three calcs uh, times $45. And then did that because that's the refund minus the $5 charge. So this um, three calcs that were returned, I am going to actually get refunded this amount of money. So um, if I take the amount that I initially paid for the calculators minus the amount that I got refunded, my actual cost after everything was said and done was 1,115, okay? Now my revenue, I only sold 22 of them for 58 bucks each. So that means my revenue was 20, was 1276. So I took my revenue minus my total cost at the end, 
and I ended up with $161 in profit. Now I realized that this part made it a little bit confusing, okay? And so I realized that I could have done this differently. I could have said, oh, well, I had 25 calculators minus three, right? Which means I only had 22 that I actually paid for. So 22 times 50 bucks was was $1,100. And then since I got refunded for the other three calculators, but only had to pay the $5 charge, then that was the $5 charge times those three calculators, which meant I only really paid 15 bucks in the end for those three calculators. So, and if I add those two costs together, my actual cost is the same 11, um, one 11 or 1,115, okay? So it's just another way of getting that actual cost. But regardless, my revenue calculation is still the same and I still have to do the revenue minus the total cost, okay? Um, I just wanted you to be aware that, you know, I did the cost and then subtracted this, how much this was being refunded. So I multiplied by the refund um, and all of that good stuff. So it was just a different way to look at it and you could do it either way. I think this one's more easier now that I did it the second time, but it's okay. Um, so number 10 says, an a automobile purchased for $39,000 is worth $2,200 after eight years. Assuming that the car's value depreciated steadily from year to year, what was it worth at the end of the third year? So if you wanna find any kind of rate, you're going to have to find um, a ratio between two units. And since it's asking me um, it's saying that the car's value depreciated from year to year. It says, what is the worth at the end of the third year? So we're basically trying to find the cost of dip, dip I can't say it, depreciation. <laughs> we're trying to find the depreciation for each year, okay? So the rate of depreciation is going to be the biggest number minus the lowest number. So this is how much it depreciated over that eight year period. And then I've got to divide by those eight years to figure out how much it depreciated per year. So this large number divided by eight is uh, 4,600. And so that's how much it's depreciating per year. So then after three years, the three year depreciation would be three times this 4,600, which is 13,800. So then the car would have depreciated $13,800. So you take what the car was worth when you purchased it minus the depreciation over those three years, and you get that the car's current worth is 25,200. Which is interesting because that means in just three years, well, I don't know. It depends. Sometimes your payments on the car don't even cover the depreciation value of the car over time. But anyway, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, so number 11 here says, a vending machine accepts nickels, dimes, and quarters. Exact change is needed to make a purchase. How many ways can a person with four nickels, three dimes, and two quarters make a 60 cent purchase from the machine? And so I always go with a larger amount and then I go down from there. So since I have um, two quarters, I started with two quarters and then the next unit lowest of quarters is dimes. So two quarters and one dime would make 60 cents. So that's one way. Then two quarters or two nickels would make a second way to get 60 cents. Um, and I didn't do pennies because if I did two quarters, I would have needed 10. Um, oh, I don't even have any pennies. I only have nickels. So two quarters, three dimes, two quarters, three dimes, and four nickels. Okay, that's all I've got. So I couldn't do it with pennies. Otherwise, I would have said two quarters plus, what, 10 pennies, but I don't have pennies. So that was off the list. So then the next thing, I'm already out of the quarters. So now I'm going to take away one of my quarters. And I'm just gonna go with one quarter. 
and then the next unit. I could use all of these and still not be over 60. So the one quarter is 25 cents. With all three dimes, I'm still only at 55 cents. So that means I could take one nickel to get those 60 cents. So that's a third way. The next one is to keep the one quarter, but instead of three dimes, do two dimes. So now that puts me at 45 cents, which means I would need three nickels. Now, if I do one quarter and one dime, then I would need to have five nickels and I don't have five nickels to work with. So that cannot be an option. Um, and if I had zero quarters, I would have three dimes total. That's 30 cents plus the four nickels. That's only 20 more cents. So that's not enough either to give me the 60 cents. So really there are only four possible combinations here. Now, number 12 says that the members of the student Activity Council on your campus are meeting to select two speakers for a month long event celebrating artists and entertainers. The first names of the choices are Ben, Will, Stuart, Hillary, Kate, and Jay. How many different ways can the two speakers be selected? So here's what I did is I started with the first one and then I said, oh, well, he could speak with him. He could speak with him. He could speak with her. He could speak with her or he could speak with this person. OK, so that's what I did. I put Bill with Will, Bill with Stuart, Bill with Hillary, Bill with Kate and Bill with Jay. Then I moved on to Will. Now, I don't need to assign Will with Ben because he's already there. Like they were already a group considered. So now I'm going to do Will with Stuart. Will with Hillary, Will with Kate, and Will with Jay. And that's these four entries. Next, I moved on to Stuart. I don't need to put Stuart with Ben because he's already here. I don't need to put Stuart with Will because that's already represented here. So I'm going to go Stuart with Hillary and Stuart with Kate and then Stuart with Jay. Then I'm going to move on to Hillary. Again, I don't need to go backwards because those are already represented in here. So Hillary with Kate and then Hillary with Jay. And then finally, I move over to Kate. Kate, don't go backwards. Kate can go with Jay. And then Jay, everybody's already had Jay in there, right? Everybody's been spoke with Jay, okay? Um, and so then I just numbered all of them so I could get all the combinations and there were 15 possible combinations. Now, number 13 says, if you spend $49.76, in how many ways can you receive change from a $50 bill? And so my answer was nine and I tried to work it all out. So if I'm talking about $50 and I'm paying this, the change that I should get is $24 or 24 cents, I'm sorry. One quarter is too much. So I cannot talk about quarters. It's just gonna be able to talk about dimes, nickels and pennies. So I'm gonna start with the greatest number of dimes. I could have two dimes and four pennies and that will give me 24 cents. There's no other combination using two dimes that will give me 24 cents because if I use a nickel that goes over 24 cents, okay? Now, I can go less dimes. So I went to one dime. If I use one dime, I can use two nickels and then the four pennies to get 24 cents. Now keeping one dime, I'm going to decrease this to one nickel, which means I would now need nine pennies to get to 24 cents. Now I took away the nickels. So one dime plus 14 pennies will give me 24 cents. Now I took away the dime. So here I could use four nickels and four pennies, the most number of nickels, right? Without going over 24. Then decrease that number of nickels by one and then increase the number of pennies by five, right? Because one nickel is worth five pennies. So three nickels is 15 cents, nine pennies is nine cents. Together, that makes 24 cents. Decrease the number of nickels again, which causes me to increase the number of pennies. That's 10 cents plus 14 is 24 cents. One nickel plus 19 pennies is also 24 cents. Or I could just straight up give them all 24 pennies, right? And so that is nine different combinations that we could use. Number 14 says, determine a route whose distance is less than 10.5 miles for the running errands to all three destinations and returning home. And so they give us this little map here. There's the bank, there's a the post office, there's the dry cleaners. 
I need to go to all three different places and return home. So the first option was start from home, go to the bank, go to the dry cleaner, go to the post office, and then return home. So from the home to the bank, that would have been 1.5 uh, miles. Then from the bank to the dry cleaner would have been three miles. Then from the dry cleaner to the post office would have been 4.5 miles. And from the post office straight home, it would have been two miles. So when I added all of these decimals together, it ended up with 11 miles. That is not less than 10.5. So now I'm gonna look at the second route that they had there. So from home to the bank, that's 1.5 miles. From the bank to the post office, that was two miles. From the post office to the dry cleaners was 4.5. From the dry cleaners to home, that was three. I added all of those up and I ended up with 11 miles, which again is not less than 10.5. And finally, we did the last path, which was from home to the post office is two. From the post office to the bank is two. From the bank to the dry cleaners is three. And then from the dry cleaners home is three. And so what that does is two plus two plus three plus three is 10. And this is less than 10.5 miles. And so this was the option that we should have chosen. Now, number 15, and I changed this name to Patrick because I saw Bob and Gary and it reminded me of SpongeBob, Gary the snail, and then Patrick the, sun, the starfish. So it says, Bob, Gary, and Patrick are college students living in adjacent dorm rooms. Gary lives in the middle dorm room. So adjacent means they're all right next to each other. So I drew the rooms like all next to each other. And it says, Gary lives in the middle dorm room. And it says their majors are history, sociology, and chemistry, although not necessarily in that order. So what I did was, is because the main idea was to determine people's majors, okay? So I created what's called the logic path. So I know that there's three different people and I know there's three different majors, but I don't know which major belongs with who, okay? And this thing usually helps you out so that if you can cross off all the blanks and only one blank is left, then you know who's got what major, right? And then you can keep using your logic to decipher from there. But they only gave me enough information to identify what Gary's ma major is. So that's why that's what the question is, okay? So I'm going to go through these bits of information and show you how I figured this out. So the history major frequently uses the new computer in Gary's dorm room when Gary is in class. So if the history major is using Gary's computer while Gary's in class, then the history major is not Gary, okay? So I put a big X. Gary is not a history major. He's obviously in class while the history major person is using his computer, okay? The next sentence says the sociology major and Bob both have 8 a.m. classes. And the associate, okay, so that right there told me that Bob is not the a sociology major because if the sociology major and Bob both have classes together, then that means Bob cannot be the sociology major. Otherwise he's got like the personality or something, right? And, but then it tells me the second piece after the comma. And the sociology major knocks on Bob's wall to make sure he is awake. Well, in order for you to knock on Bob's wall, you have to be close to Bob's room. You have to be in a room right next to Bob's room. Gary is the only person that is able to knock on Bob's room. Because it doesn't matter whether Bob is here or here, Gary will be able to knock on his door. Patrick, however, if Patrick and Bob are both here, it doesn't matter who's on which side, they cannot knock on Bob's door. So if Patrick is here, he can't knock on Bob's door. If Bob's here, he can't knock on his door, okay? On the wall, not the door, the wall. So you literally have to be on the other side of the wall, okay? So the only person who can knock on Bob's door is Gary. And so since Bob and the sociology major have the classes together and to make sure that Bob wakes up on time, Bob's gotta get his wall banged by the sociology major. 
Gary's the only one that can bang on Bob's wall. So Gary has to be the sociology major. Okay. And I think I wrote that here. It says sociology major must be Gary since only Gary can knock on someone else's wall. And that's because they told me that Gary was in the middle room. Now, very last question of here. And this is a magic square is a square array of numbers arranged so that the numbers in all rows, all columns, and the two diagonals have the same sum. Sum meaning you add them all together. Use the properties of a magic square to fill in the array on the missing numbers in the magic square below. So they had all these numbers here, 7, 16, 17, and 27. And then they had blanks and they labeled this blank A, this blank B, this blank C, and this blank D, okay? Now I do see that I do have a diagonal here fully, right? There's nobody missing in that diagonal. In this diagonal, somebody's missing. In this vertical, some two people are missing. In this vertical, two people are missing. In this vertical, only one person is missing. In this uh, row or, or uh, horizontal, one is missing. Here, two are missing. And here, two are missing, okay? So, but I noticed that in this particular diagonal, all the entries are there. So I added all of those entries together to get the magic number. The magic number is 51. So supposedly, since this is a magic square, it doesn't matter whether I add this way, this way, these ways, or these ways across, that all of those individual sums should be 51. So the first thing I did was I looked at um, A. Notice that A is the only one missing in this row. So I know that A will have to be 51 minus 7 minus 16, right? Because the whole thing's supposed to be 51, but I'm going to take out 7 and take out 16 to figure out what A is. And A is 28. Once I had A, because it was the only one in this row, I also noticed that C was the only one in the column. So for C, I did 51, take away 16, take away 27, and I got that the number that belongs here is eight, okay? Now for D, or yeah, for D, I used this diagonal because he was the only one in that diagonal. So 51 minus the 17 minus the 16, and that gave me that this end box should have an 18 in it. Now the last two that I calculated were B and E because B and E were in columns, they weren't in any diagonals, but they were in columns or rows that had two unknowns, okay? And so I had to wait until one of those numbers were figured out before I was able to calculate B and E. Now that I, now that I do have it, I can figure this out. So what I used was I used this column. So 51 minus seven minus whatever we got for D, which was 18, right? Didn't we get 18 for D? That tells me that B needs to be 26. Then for, um, I also use this row to calculate E. So 51 minus D, which was 18 minus 27 was six. And so then I got six in that spot. Now there are different ways and different orders in which you can find these values. Um, this is just an example so that I could explain to you how to do it. But um, which way you go about it, like you could have found C first and then A or D first, it doesn't matter. And then eventually you could have found these the other way. Instead of using the vertical for B, you could have used the horizontal since you already knew what C was. Instead of using the horizontal for E, you could have used the vertical since you already know what A was, so on and so forth. So there's many different possibilities of how to obtain that answer. Um, but you've given given an, an example of what's going on behind the scenes and the reasoning so that you can do one on your own. This is the last problem of this section. So um, I will be seeing you in the next video.